Hello, everyone. My name is Lloyd Waits. I got my PhD here a few months ago, and now I work at this place called Draper, which is down the street, and I can't talk about what I do over there, unfortunately. But when I'm not there, I, uh, I work on AI in, in my free time and explore a lot of the same things you guys have been talking about, um, ChatGPT, um, AI transformers, and all of these different pieces, and really seeing how they can start to fit together to do some interesting things. So this talk isn't going to be some fundamental paradigm shift. This isn't going to be about how I made a new transformer architecture. There's not going to be all of these plots about statistical modeling and, and things like that. It's going to be filled with pretty pictures of AI-generated art. But what I realized when I was when I was doing this is that you don't necessarily need to do all of these fancy things in order to do the things that I personally was interested in. Even if these AI models are flawed, which we've heard over and over again today about all of the individual problems that they have, you can still do some really interesting things. And with just a couple hundred lines of code, I was able to do some things that I personally never thought was I was going to see in my lifetime. Um, and so what is kind of the science fiction motivation behind this? Like, where, where would I want to get started with this? What is a long-term goal that I'd want to reach towards? Well, people talk a lot about virtual assistants. We've heard that thrown up today a bunch of times, right? Like when people think of virtual assistants, they don't think about Alexa. They think about something like Jarvis from Iron Man. No one wants to talk to their alarm clock. Uh, Alexa was too many years too early. Um, what people want to have a conversation with is people want to have a conversation with another person. And all the time, it's a person that they've actually never met, maybe like a historical figure. Imagine being able to talk to Abraham Lincoln, but not being not just talking to Abraham Lincoln now through textbooks and him regurgitating information, but actually in the context of his own time, and having him being able to remember the conversations that you had with him so that you could drop it and go back again. You can follow the same idea with a fictional character. I know I personally would love to talk to Spider-Man or, or, or Tony Soprano, right? And maybe be able to actually delve a little bit deeper into what these characters were intended to do by the way their authors were, were intending them to be. Um, and you could even imagine talking to celebrities or people that you've never met. It would be great to talk to Elon Musk about business ideas or, or Stephen Wolfram about mathematics if he's listening. <laughs> um, but also uh, leaving a legacy, right? A lot of people will talk about, um, nowadays it's very popular for people who are, um, who are ill to start writing letters to their family so that they can be remembered by something. But imagine if you could use these tools and put them together to actually make something a little bit more. Um, and I think all of these things are really actually just the same problem in, in the same architecture. Uh, you, if you're a real nerd, you'll actually know that Jarvis isn't just a, an AI, it's actually an a engram of St Tony Stark's butler. Because what you're really doing is you're creating characters. And so what I'm going to be talking about today is character generation. Making these kind of artificial um, people that you can talk to that have characteristics that are given to them by uh, personal data. And so si since I'm in the educational part of this, this talk, I'm going to say, how is this actually useful for education? And I mentioned talking to historical figures. You can talk to Abraham Lincoln as much as you want, right? Um, but what I think is even more interesting is what if you completely close the loop? What if you have multiple historical figures that have a discussion with each other? And these are the same arguments that we're still having today, right? We still argue about what, what our forefathers meant in the Constitution or what this philosopher would have said to that philosopher. Um, and when you see them communicate with each other rather than communicating with you, you can contrast these ideas and you can understand the underlying biases of each of these cases, which is super important because when you're taking a step back, you can actually make the decisions for yourself. You're not getting this news article that, is, that has these underlying biases and is pretending to be objective truth. And I think this is actually a really important shift in the way that we're looking at things because there are so many people chasing over and over again. There are literally armies of people at, at all of these different companies trying to make an AI that only fits objective truth. But the thing is, is these AI bias problems are not going anywhere. The AI bias problems are, are, are really here to stay, and I am yet to see a solution that it, I think is going to solve having an AI really give a true objective truth, because no one can agree on what that actually is. But if you put in a character, an individual is flawed. An individual, an individual has biases. And you can expect that when you're talking to a character. So maybe if we interact with an AI pretending that it's a character, we can see, oh, this is what we're actually looking at. This person is flawed, and I can form my own opinion separate from this rather than pretending everything that they say is true. I can say this is a, this is a mimic of what this person is actually thinking about. And you can do this and still ask questions in a directly applicable way. Um, and so I staged this. Um, I took two of my favorite writers 
Ayn Rand, who's a, a very controversial but um, very insightful author, in my opinion, who wrote Atlas Shrugged, a kind of libertarian manifesto talking about the evils of overgovernance, governance um, and Rod Serling, who is the most famous for writing the Twilight Zone episodes that have become famous for a very long time, but was also a very big proponent of, of things like social welfare programs. Um, and so I wonder what it would be like if these two people who I've, I love their writing and I've, done a lot, I've read a lot of their stuff, were able to actually talk to each other and have kind of a, an argument because their, their opinions are, are seemingly so opposite. And so I have a clip of them talking to each other. Let me just say, the government needs to step up and take responsibility for protecting the rights of all its citizens, not just the wealthy and powerful. Oh, please, the government is the last thing we need when it comes to protecting rights. Therefore, it's constantly infringing on our individual freedoms, and it needs to stop. The only protection we need is protection of private property rights and the market. Collectivism is a cancer on society, plain and simple. These people are all notorious and wrong minded. Uh, however, you're, uh, <laughs> however um, you can kind of get the, the gist from that. Um, and if you're familiar with how they speak and how they talk, you'll, you'll see that all of these different pieces sound just like how they talk. They're able to adapt to these, their individual ideas that they've been trained on to be able to come and adapt to new ideas that are given to them by their opponent. Um, and if you've ever seen an episode of The Twilight Zone or, or heard Ayn Rand give a speech, you can hear this is, this is what it sounds like. This is, it sounds like... We, we're well, certainly giving an introduction to the Twilight Zone. Um, and they're also able to feed off each other's ideas. This isn't just um, some one-dimensional piece regurgitating information. They're able to remember what the previous person had said, come up with a, a further idea, further extend it, and then build on that idea, and pick up on really subtle things. Like one thing that I noticed was that despite Rod Serling's hatred of collectivism and the importance of the individual, he still really found it important to have social programs help people for those in need. Um, which a lot of people don't, even real people, have a, have a tough time grasping, but GPT was able to replicate that in a very strong way. Um, and from more of a technical aspect, you could see that it was, you could do it in a case that is both animated, which was Rod Serling's case, or you could do it in a photorealistic case, such as uh, Anne Rand. And this is totally closed loop, right? Like, I didn't write a script or, or anything like that. This was just created through um, a, a totally closed system. But you can also open that loop. Um, and I did this here. This is a screenshot of another video I did where I, I actually talked to a simulated version of Elon Musk about how to run his business. And I used uh, speech to text um, using Whisper to be able to actually talk, talk to him. It would feed through GPT to then create uh, an animated version of Elon Musk that would, that would talk to me. So how does this work? Well, there, there's two steps. The first is actually generating the character. And what you need to do that is, is three things. Obviously, you need a photo or some, um, some video that you could use to mimic so that they're able to animate that face. Um, you need a, a voice audio file that you can clone. Um, and then you need data to train it on to make it actually generate the character. So you could do things like the writing of Abraham Lincoln, or you can be kind of glib and say, oh, well, Abraham Lincoln was also a vampire slayer, right? And it will take this information and then change the, the output based on that. And so once you have this actual character, you have some interaction query where you say, okay, Abe Lincoln, what do you think about the Confederacy? This is fed to your large language model of choice, whether that be GPT, whether that be Llama, or, or whatever else you would like to plug in. Um, there's advantages to them, like Llama being able to run on a more local machine where other things are closed, which has been a big topic of discussion from many of the talks today. That creates a text response. The text response is then eaten up by uh, some kind of voice cloning software. There's a bunch of different ones out there. I personally prefer 11 Labs because it gets very good. Um, it has a pretty good quality. And then it animates the faces using, uh, again, multiple different types of software to generate that before. And ta-da, now you have talking Abraham Lincoln talking about the evils of vampires in the Confederacy. So what are some of the, the use cases of this? Well, I've talked a bit about talking to historical figures, but I mean, imagine talking to Robert Oppenheimer about physics, right? Imagine talking to Bill Gates about coding. Um, you could have these individual people and see that they might not be perfect, but you could learn it from the sources that, that did it. And so that's a really cool educational tool. You can see the perspective of how they're learning and learn it in that specific context. You can also do it for fun. I had a friend who used this, this same software to talk to one of his favorite characters from a book. Um, it's just like an, an interesting way to kind of learn more about the world that you're really interested in. But another more practical aspect is it could be used for something like immersion training. So going to another country now is not only fun, but and sometimes confusing, but it can also be a little bit dangerous, right? And there's only so much you can learn from things like Duolingo or, or from books. 
But you also, it's, it's more than just knowing the language, it's understanding the culture. But imagine if you were able to have an individual character who will talk to you about this 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you don't have to go and bug your one friend who's been to that country that one time. They're just there, and they'll talk to you about any kind of cultural issues that you wanna know. They'll talk to you, help you understand the world around you, and it can help keep you safe so that you don't end up in, in, a, in a jam in a foreign country where you're, you may or may not know the language. The next application that I've been playing with is predicting human behavior, right? And this is something I'm very excited about. But it actually isn't that fundamental if you think about it. Because when you're making these individual characters, what you're really doing, and like we've said a hundred times today, people are trying to, to figure out what the next word in the chain is. You're really making some kind of Markov chain that predicts an individual's behavior. So if you have a model that's trained based on an individual person, you should be able to say what the next thing that they're, you should be able to guess what the next thing they're going to say is. So here, here's your scenario, right? You're walking in, you have to go and talk to some venture capitalist or something, right? And you want to give your pitch. You go in, you give your pitch, and you practice it on some character that you tend to look like this venture capitalist, right? And you do this over and over again until you get just the right words to fit. Um, and so far, I've been testing this on someone that I work with. Uh, he, he's been graciously giving me all of his personal data. Um, and so I've been able to make a, a predictive model of him. And I've gotten some pretty interesting results so far. Uh, but we'll see how it goes in the future. Um, but the last piece that I wanted to talk about was understanding someone who may not be here at all. If you're able to predict someone's behavior, that doesn't mean that you need to have an individual person there. Right? What if this person died? But you still have their model. You still have their engram. Right? And this is kind of an elephant in the room in a lot of these cases because it, it, it's, it's very obvious, but what if I wanted to talk to some, what if I wanted to talk to my grandfather again? Right? What if I wanted to see if he was proud of me? What if I wanted to talk to my dad and get advice from him after I wasn't, wasn't able to talk to him anymore? And this isn't just some kind of science fiction idea anymore. This has actually been done. Um, you see, in the upper left here, this is my uncle Artie. And Artie got married late in life to his wife, Marcella. Uh, Marcella, um, they, they were married for about six months and they really were soulmates. I, I was around them all the time. But six months after their marriage, basically still on their honeymoon, already came home and he found Marcella deceased in their bed. Right? That's not something you get over. Right? Out, out of the blue, completely unexpected. And so Artie was in a lot of pain. He, uh, he'd go to the gravesite every day. He would talk to a photo of her. And, uh, he, he told me that he didn't really want to live anymore after that. I was able to get an old voicemail of Marcella. Um, I was able to describe her based on, on the times that I met her. I have a picture from her obituary, and I brought Artie in, and um, I was able to have him have a conversation and finally tell his wife how much he missed her again. Um, and after he, he finally stopped crying, he, uh, he couldn't stop thanking me for helping to give him some closure. So, I mean, this is, this is a real impact of this technology. And I've had people tell me that this is dystopian, that this is unethical, that this is, is, is wrong, but that's not what I saw. I, uh, I saw a, a close family friend of mine um, finally get some closure and finally start to heal on something that was a really tragic situation. So um, I'd like to close with that, and uh, thank you for, for having me and having this great talk. Thank you. Uh, unfortunately, we're running quite behind now, so we need to go to the next talk. Uh, do you want to do a quick one, if you can keep it under 20 seconds? Uh, OK, very quick. So um, I want to ask about the legal aspect of using the characters. Like, do you have to get a permission from the creator or from the family of the person? Or, like, how does it work legally? Well, so I'm not a company. Um, so uh, in, in terms of, of legal legality, I'm, I'm sure that there's going to be lines to cross if I was to ever try and do this commercially. But right now, it's, it's just a Python script on my laptop. So I haven't crossed any of those lines yet. Thank you. Thank you.